everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer on Billboard, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Access.com, and many other places on the internet, welcoming you to another program of our Things We Said Today weekly, almost, discussion of the Beatles past, present, and to come. Let me first introduce my two cohorts from the state of Connecticut, the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. From the state of Maine, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, the former head of the Beatles desk at the New York Times, and he's still there occasionally, and we could talk about other instances where where Mr. Cozen uh, uh, told us things uh, in that uh, nobody else knew, but uh, you know, on the on Beatle uh, sections of the internet. But in any event, um, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, Hello everyone. And we're going to have some, we have a special guest today from another section of the country, from the state of Arkansas. Two weeks ago. Um, we got a, a note from uh, a listener, Chris Delisle. Chris, if you're out there, thank you. He said, here's what he, he wrote to us on uh, our YouTube page um, where we post the shows. He said, didn't John have to put Yaya on the album due to a lawsuit that originated with the publisher of You Can't Catch Me, where John had taken You Come All Flat Top for Come Together? This was probably his way of putting it on the record without having to work on it too much. Well, that comment kind of got us talking after one of our shows and we said you know the person who we know that knows a lot about Beatles legal matters that has actually written uh, extensively on it for those of you that remember my old Abbey Road's Beatle, uh, Beatle page site there were four essays on Beatle legal uh, matters on lawsuits the ones that really got noticed a lot in years and still do are the the ones he wrote on the George Harrison My Sweet Lord He So Fine Plagiarism suit and the Lennon Morris Levy suit and we want to welcome for the for our show today Mr. Joey Self Joey is an attorney um, in Fort Smith, Arkansas. His practice is primarily in Western Arkansas, and he handles criminal defense matters as well as personal injury, divorce, family law cases, bankruptcy, social security, disability, and other civil matters. But he's going to—he's going to—he's here talking to us today about Beatles legal cases. Um, Joey, welcome to Things We Said Today. Thank you so much. I don't know where to start. I mean, we'll there's start so with much. The Yaya question. Well, yeah, let's start. Okay, that's a good. That's a good point, Alan. Uh, answer, uh, how about the Yaya question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah, it's yeah. just best to just tell everyone what the whole case was about, in case there are any listeners that aren't aware of it. That's that's true. Let's go there first, uh, um, Joey. Okay. Well, the article that I wrote actually focused on the second lawsuit between Lennon and Levy. There was a first lawsuit in which Levy claimed that Lennon had infringed on a copyright that he held, uh, that Levy held. You Can't Catch Me, the Chuck Berry song, wound up in Levy's copyright collection. Right before it went to, to trial, uh, there was a settlement reached. Lennon, even though it was a Lennon-McCartney composition, Lennon took responsibility for the settlement and agreed to record three of three of the songs that Levy had a copyright on. Uh, the three that it wound up being was Ya Ya, and of course You Can't Catch Me, Lennon did his own version of that, and a song called Angel Baby. Well, the, ne the agreement was that the next album, that was the way it was phrased, that Lennon was going to do, would contain those songs that Levy held the copyright on. It turned out that Phil Spector took off with the tapes, and Lennon wrote Walls and Bridges and got it out, that was the next album, which was a breach of the agreement because there was only one song on Walls and Bridges that Levy had any interest in. So another suit was filed, and that was the article that I wrote that was on your webpage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there, is there, I mean, what happened? How, how did, how did it, how did it turn out? The lawsuit that Levy filed against Lennon? Mm-hmm. 
Letty would have been better off never going to the courthouse. He lost. He was the plaintiff, and yet Lennon counterclaimed against Levy. And before it was all said and done on appeal, uh, Levy wound up owing Lennon, oh my goodness, uh, close to $80,000. Okay. Go Can ahead. I ask some questions? Go ahead, Ken. First of all, I don't know how much our listeners know about this, but when this happened, there was an agreement that was made between Lennon and, and Levy. This was after the Mind Games album was finished. And apparently it was just an oral agreement. There was nothing signed, right? Oh, I don't know. Because the uh, looking at my article to refresh my memory, it, it says the case was settled out of court on October 12th. And as part of the settlement, the lawsuit was dropped in return for Lennon's promise to record three songs. Whether that promise was reduced to writing, I don't know. I would so you're talking about the you know, the first lawsuit, the the come the together lawsuit. lawsuit. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah, and and maybe maybe you should explain to the listeners as well that you know the the whole point of him having to like why that is a remedy recording three songs that he owns. Well, when you're settling the case, you can be kind of creative. When if it had gone to the judge to make a decision or a jury, if it was a jury trial as to how much damages the copyright infringement on You Can't Catch Me would have entitled Levy to recover, the judge would have been limited to just handing money from one side to the other. They got creative in settlement, and Levy was going to receive royalties on the three songs that Lennon recorded, I suppose he thought that was a good deal for him. I mean, Few people settle thinking they just made a bad deal, so I'm sure Levy thought it was a good deal. Yeah. Lennon was already recording the songs, so it wasn't going to hurt him. So, right. But you know, to, to answer what this lister wrote to us, did John have to do that on Walls and Bridges, you know, and record "Ya Ya," even though it was not a serious recording of the song? Did he do that really to at least temporarily, you know, at least give Morris Levy one song at the time. I've been married 36 years and I learned a long time ago the right answer to a lot of questions is I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it was not in the opinion and in the other readings that I have done, I'm not sure if he thought that was going to somehow mollify Levy, that maybe he thought Levy would see that one was about the same as three so and just go away, but no, that it was not explained in the research that I did as to why there was just the one or why he put the one on there. He had to know that wasn't going to, to settle them. Yeah. It wasn't going to be the, um, the agreement that they had reached. Well, this is why it's a little confusing to me, if you don't mind my explaining this. Because we know that John had to deliver three songs that were in that publishing catalog. It was the Big Seven catalog. And... According to the book Eight Arms to Hold You from Chip Mattinger, it does say in there that while Yaya, that um, Morris Levy has a songwriting credit on there, which even that is in question really, uh, because originally he wasn't listed as a songwriter on the song. But in that book, it said that Yaya was not in the Big Seven catalog. So if that is the case, and we're saying that there had to be three songs that John recorded, You've got You Can't Catch Me. You mentioned Angel Baby. Angel Baby was only released at first on Roots. So, you know, it wasn't on the rock and roll album. How were the three songs covered? Well, I'm, I'm looking right now at Levy's claim against Lennon. And in the court opinion, it says that Lennon had recorded three songs owned by Levy's company. Big Seven, but only You Can't Catch Me and Yaya actually appeared on Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Yaya appeared on two successive albums. The judge apparently was convinced that Yaya was a Levy-held song, so I'm not sure where Chip uh, is is coming from on that. I, I That's the first I'd heard of it when you mentioned it. Okay, and I guess, because I always thought maybe Sweet Little Sixteen, because it's another Chuck Berry song was also a big seven song, but I guess it wasn't. It was not. 
I read something, and it may have been in Professor Sucher's book, that Levy wound up with You Can't Catch Me because of some movie it was in. Mm. I don't I don't remember the details of it. I'm sitting here, but it, it Levy wound up with it because it appeared in, I don't know, some of those rock movies that they were doing in the mid-50s. Okay. When you mentioned Professor Sucher's book, we should let everybody know what he's talking about is the book Baby, You're a Rich Man, um, Suing the Beatles for Fun and Profit. How did the Roots album figure into that, Joey? Figure into what, Steve? Well, into into the whole complicated situation. I mean... Uh, oh, yes. Well, what happened was that after Lennon did not have the three songs on his next album, he had a meeting with Levy to explain to him what happened, that Phil Spector had taken off with the tapes, and that he was still working on the rock and roll oldies album, and he produced a rough mix or demos or whatever it was of the, the works that he had been doing to demonstrate that, yes, I am working on this, and he gave the tape to Levy. There was some conversation about whether... Uh, Lennon could give the rights to do mail order um, releases of his records. And Levy took it upon himself after it became apparent that Capitol was going to be issuing an album and they were trying to keep Levy from issuing his, uh, that he decided to go ahead and issue Roots as a mail order, quickly got served with an injunction, and Roots became a collector's item. Okay, okay. Um, Alan, did you wanna did you wanna jump in here? Sure. Um, so the next thing that happened then was that um, Lennon and probably EMI must have sued Levy uh, to um, well, first of all, get the Roots album off the market. And but but what was there? I, I I think there's a degree to which do do you think that maybe John was just sort of naive? I mean, the way that you describe the conversations, you know, they're sitting at dinner and Levy brings up the thing about mail order, and John says, "Well, I'm um, you know I am signed to EMI," and Levy says, "Well, you know, Alan Klein says." <laughs> that that doesn't matter. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and Lennon seems to have just accepted that as a possibility. I remember pointing out in the article, and I'm, I'm looking at it now, that uh, it was funny to me that in 1974 that Levy is quoting Klein as some sort of authority to Lennon because Klein and Lennon were suing each other at that point. Right. But, uh, right. Uh, but that's what happened. The, the Levy referred back to Alan Klein's 1971 Playboy interview and also an inter, uh, a conversation he'd had with Klein in 73 that he said, oh, I think we can do the mail order. I don't think your contract with EMI covers mail order. Well, Lennon, I mean, let's be honest. He, the idea of doing something novel would have appealed to him, mm -hmm. probably did appeal to him. And I pulled the article here. I'm looking um, after they learned at EMI that uh, that Roots was going to come out. Capital threatened legal action against those who were involved in the manufacture and distribution of Roots, and the production of Roots stopped. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe there was a lawsuit. I may have set an injunction, but I don't. I don't think they actually had to get a judge to issue one. But as soon as that happened, then Levy filed suit claiming breach of when Rock and Roll came out and only had the two songs, and Levy claimed there was a breach of contract. Right. Hmm. He also claimed, I think, that um, that on the basis of that dinner where Lennon and Lennon's lawyer and Levy were talking about this mail order possibility, he claimed that that conversation superseded the original settlement for Come Together. So, so that in Levy's mind, it was no longer a question of you got to do these three songs and that will compensate me for your ripping a couple of lines off of You Can't Catch Me. Um, it now was you got to do those three songs and let me market the album on television myself, right? Yeah, that was his position is that contract, that over dinner contract that you talk about was intended to replace the come together settlement that 
and yet it, would make it, it was only verbal too, right? Right. Uh, yeah, but verbal contracts can be enforced hmm. as long as the terms are definite and the parties agree on them. Mm-hmm. But and they, there were, were, were they? Uh, no. Part of the problem <laughs> that Levy, part of the problem Levy had was at trial he kept changing his position. As I mentioned in the article, it's not unusual for a party to amend their pleadings as the case unfolds. I learn more about it. It's a little more unusual, not unheard of, to amend it after the trial starts. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about whether there was the meeting of the minds that is necessary for a contract, Mm -hmm. and you're in the middle of trial and you're changing what you're claiming are your damages, that tends to indicate there wasn't a meeting of the minds in the first place. Right. If one mind can't decide on what the contract is, then how can two? Right. Hmm. I mean, they hadn't, for instance, settled on what John's royalties would be for the album as such, which I think might have been the defining issue for the judge about why that can't be accepted as a contract, because because they don't really have the kind of details you need to have a contract, even if it's a verbal contract. They just didn't get into right. that, seemingly. Exactly. The, the royalty part was was definitely a factor, maybe the main factor that the judge ruled. I mean, he said that it was a tentative agreement at that dinner meeting, but he was going to... Uh, there was no agreement, as you said, uh, about the method or the amount of calculation of the royalties. Of course, what we know about Levy and paying royalties from his roulette days and the artists that have complained about not getting any money, that probably wasn't a big deal to Levy anyway. <laughs> mm. right. Let's move to the to the Harrison suit, because I think that really, that's a mind blower, actually, when you get into the, the little bottom details about that. Joey, give us a general, a general thing about, a uh, general introduction to the Harrison, uh, my sweet Lord, he's, he's so fine suit. I will. Let me do something before I forget, though. Anyone who wants to look up these cases, if they put in their search bar, Joseph Self, use my, my legal name, and Beatles lawsuit or uh, Lennon versus Levy, or in this case, my sweet Lord, it will be on the first page of the search. So if you want to see the article we're talking about, you can do it right now if you want. Right. Yeah. And I should I should mention that both of your I don't I I don't know if your articles are elsewhere, but I mean they are still on my Abbey Road site, abbeyroad.net. Um, they can be they can be found there if you go to the contents page, uh, uh, contents.htm, which sounds like sounds like old uh, HTML, and it is. They are there along with a lot of other the, a lot of the other articles, uh, but. Um, yes, they are. They are there. But anyway, let's talk about the the Harrison suit. Uh, give us a little rundown on what happened there. Well, George Harrison in 1969 came up with this song. Uh, he was touring with Delaney and Bonnie at the time. Came up with a a riff, and he and the people around him started vamping on it, and. Eventually, it became the song My Sweet Lord. Harrison apparently didn't think too much of it because he let Billy Preston record it first, but it wasn't a hit for Harrison, I mean, for for Preston. And eventually, George recorded his own version for All Things Must Pass, and it was released as a single. And about that time, it caught the attention of the the people that held the bright uh, song catalog, and a suit against George claiming that My Sweet Lord infringed on the copyright of He's So Fine followed shortly thereafter. Okay. But what was interesting there is is not just the fact the suit was filed, but it was actually who was who was part of the suit. And it well, wasn't it wasn't just Harrison and Bright Songs. It became interesting later. At the start it was Bright and Harrison. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little later, it became Alan Klein's company involved, and that's part of the intrigue of the whole thing. Right. But that wasn't until that wasn't until much later. The, uh, in fact, Klein was acting as Harrison's agent 
uh, I'm looking now at the article, in February of 71, he contacted the, the major stockholder of White Tunes to try to resolve the suit. And uh, like I said, he was acting as Harrison's agent in 71. By the time the case was decided, uh, 76 or so, Klein had bought the rights to He's So Fine and was then suing the man he used to advise. And that's and that's that's the that is the real you know I remember uh, you know talking I think to you about this back then and even now that's that is absolutely incredible that Alan Klein did that I mean it's it's astonishing it's amazing that he thought he'd get away with it actually I mean it, right. it's such a, an mm. obvious conflict of interest that you know yeah it or in, well, in inappropriate more than a con- <laughs> yeah more than a conflict of interest I mean it was it was. He was he. I mean, I don't know how. I, I don't want to say. I, I don't want to say what I'm thinking. But I mean, that's the that's appalling. That's absolutely you know <laughs> appalling that he would actually try and do that. But this again leads to, and we don't need to get into this discussion. I mean, what you know, all the all the talk about what Alan Klein was. You know, it's it, it's amazing that he that he would do this. Um, and 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 Joey, I mean, the outcome did not end up in Alan Klein's favor, did it not? Uh, no, it did not. He wound up receiving what he paid for. He's so fine, a uh, substantial sum of money. He had paid five hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars for the rights to He's so fine, and the judge ordered that Harrison would pay that to Klein, and then Harrison would have those rights transferred to him. Mm-hmm. So didn't, Harrison didn't, owns both songs in yes, the end. Yeah. In the end. Didn't Klein, however, have to pay, end up paying back to Harrison? Or did, wasn't there some penalty that, that Klein got from uh, uh, had to had to deal with as far as that goes? He didn't get uh, off Scott you didn't get off Scott free on that, right? Well no, I mean he had the, the privilege and honor of paying his attorneys for this, and I'm always in favor of that. But no, it looks like that as far as the, the purchase price of He's So Fine was the measure of damages. The, the judge, as I say in the article, rather than just have Klein hand over his ill-gotten gains, what great writing that is, uh, <laughs> the, the judge ordered Klein to hold the rights for Harrison and trust until such time as Harrison paid him the 587. Uh, I think it would have been hilarious if the judge had said, Hmm, uh, no, I think you just hand it over. But <laughs> well, Klein uh, wanted so, to sell it to him for 700,000, right? I mean, Klein wanted to make a 200,000 or a little more than 115,000 profit on it. And I'm not it? seeing uh, the number may be in this article. I don't see it right now, as I'm, but that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I may have read that somewhere else. No, I, I'm, I'm looking at the paragraph here. It says, um, uh, and I'll read. I'll read. It says, Still, I find it funny that in purchasing the rights to he so fine client offered to sell some of the rights to the song to his former client for seven hundred thousand dollars. Okay. It is not clear that all rights Klein obtained would have been part of this deal, but Klein did Harrison a big favor. Otherwise, Harrison would have found himself facing payment of a judgment in the amount of $1.6 million, my eyes said. Not as good as it used to be in those days. And would not but, would not own the rights to He's So Fine. So, yeah, we skipped over that part but, because the trial was in two parts. There was mm-hmm. first the determination, was this a copyright infringement? Okay. Which makes perfect sense. You wouldn't call in all your financial experts to tell you how much damages uh, the holder of Bright Songs would have suffered because of the infringement, unless there is actually an infringement. So uh, they had that part of the suit first, and Judge Owen, who, by the way, was an opera writer, Alan could speak to that probably better than I, <laughs> about how good of an opera writer he was. But uh, they were in front of a, a jurist that had quite a bit of knowledge about music. And when he found that He's So Fine was copy, or that My Sweet Lord had copied He's So Fine, then he had to determine what the damages were going to be. And that, to me, was a fascinating part of the decision, was, was figuring but, out how much to attribute 
for example, the sales of All Things Must Pass, where we got those sales figures in the judge's opinion, and how much of that number needed to be turned over to to Bright. I'd say it's all in here. I'm not going to read numbers because it makes right. people's eyes glaze over. They so mentions all the songs that, that got airplay at the time and what was responsible for the sales of All Things Must Pass. And most of it was due to My Sweet Lord. And, you know, a, a, a certain decent percentage went to What Is Life. And all the other songs got 1% that were mentioned that got airplay. So right. there's some kind of uh, configuration there. But. It, it doesn't seem very scientific, does it? I mean, I mean, you, you're assessing damages for the copyright of one song and then claiming that the whole reason the album sold was because of that one song and that therefore Harrison's royalties on the rest of the songs should sort of be, uh, you know, attached a bit as well. You know, that he should have to pay some of the royalties that he got on the whole album, not just My Sweet Lord. That seems awfully weird to me. It was weird to me as well. I mean, think about a song from a similar time, Brandy by Looking Glass. The albums that Looking Glass sold, you could pretty much attribute to the song Brandy being on there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can use the same analogy to George Harrison's first, I, I know there was Wonderwall, I know there was Electronic, but his first album of songs, uh, pop songs, after the breakup of the Beatles, and to say that it sold X number of more copies because My Sweet Lord was on it, I think it, it really stretches the imagination. Mm -hmm. If My Sweet Lord had not been on the album, then I think it's reasonable to assume What Is Life would have been the opening single. Or maybe, I don't know, uh, If Not For You, or, or some other songs that have been popular over the years. And to think that My Sweet Lord catapulted the album sales on that album the way Looking Glass's hit single Brandy would have done it, <laughs> to me, it just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I always remember George gave an interview where he went out of his way to talk about the lawsuit without mentioning Alan Klein's name. <laughs> and, and he said that the very same person who encouraged him to make My Sweet Lord the single was the very same person who ended up buying out the rights to the song and suing him. So, you know, I'm sure George is being as careful as he could be, not wanting another lawsuit, probably by mentioning his name. But, uh, you know, it's and he also said he could write a whole book on the whole lawsuit, which he probably could have. Well, he did write a song on it. Yes. Yeah, well, this, this, this song. song. Right. So, I mean, there, that that's something also that is part of the story. And I mean, that, that that's one of the craziest Beatle lawsuit stories. There, uh, maybe the, maybe the craziest. Uh, we were we were briefly d talking about a few others. So I mean, there's uh, without we don't have time obviously to go into all of them in in detail. But Joey, just you know, briefly talk about a couple of the others. The I don't know the the one that the one that I'd completely forgotten about was the McCartney suing the other three Beatles. We we were talking. You and I were talking about this um, in the run up before the show when we were talking when we were preparing yesterday. Talk about that just very briefly. Uh, you mean the article that's on your website? Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean just the, just the suit in general. Well, the suit in general was that as 1970 unfolded, uh, the McCartney situation was becoming untenable for him. Um, we all know the story about how he wanted to release McCartney, his debut album, on a certain day. And the others told him it was going to have to wait. And he blew up about that. And I believe that album had something, had Alan Klein's name on it. Uh, that uh, Somebody um, the, correct me. The trade ads. Um, yes. Some of the trade ads said Apple and Abco Company. Um, uh, yes. and, and he objected yeah. to that, but the album itself, I don't think did. I, I think that's what I was remembering as well was that Abco name was on there, yeah. but there was question about whether they, the Beatles were going to be able to make their tax bills. Uh, there were questions about how the royalty, uh, Klein had negotiated them a higher royalty and, uh, McCartney famously said, well, if you're screwing us, I don't see how it is. Well, he finally figured out how it was because the deal that was struck was that Klein's company was to get a percentage of the increased royalties, and they were taking 
uh, royalties off of albums or, or royalties that they were not entitled to. Uh, the money was getting tied up. EMI didn't know who to pay it to. And eventually, uh, the last day of the year, McCartney filed for an, for the appointment of a receiver uh, to start handling the money and man- managing Apple's affairs. I wrote an article that the other three that's on your web page had appeared in the 910, Doug Sulpey's publication. Right. And then the... Paul versus uh, John, George, and Ringo, that was in Beatle fan. Bill King and I got together somehow. Alan may have been involved in getting this together. I don't remember. But uh, either I came up with the idea of writing it or Bill asked me to. I don't, I, you know, it's been 15, 20 years, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And I wrote it from the perspective of why Paul felt it necessary to file the suit. And this is the one article that I've received the most criticism about uh, because you have my email address on your web page. I have gotten emails over the years about all of these articles. And when I say the most criticism, three or four people have said, you know, that was a very one sided argument or article. And I said, yeah, it was intended to be. Uh, it was why Paul felt necessary to take that step. That was the limit of the article. And in it, I ran through all of his objections as to what had been going on with Apple and and with Klein. I've got the, in my files, thanks to Alan, I've got the counter where the Beatles lawyers or the others, I should say, John Paul and and, uh, uh, John George and Ringo's lawyers were arguing. It was almost like Paul said, yes, it is. And they said, no, it's not. It would have made a great Monty Python skit. Uh, Someone should do that. Um, The argument sketch. There was no reason to write the other argument or the other article because it was just the opposite of what they were saying. If Paul said, well, Klein's taking money he's not entitled to, they said, oh, no, he's not. Um, You know, Klein's exercising control. He's not supposed to. Oh, no, he's not. I mean, it was just (laughs) that was just what it was. The judge found that Paul's arguments were sound and appointed a receiver. Wow. Actually, the very end of the article that you wrote on that. I really like what you said here. (laughs) It's uh, pretty powerful. Those outside the band that criticized him did not know or fully comprehend what he felt was wrong. Those inside that disparaged him were the one that had caused much of the problems to begin with. The wonder of it all is not that McCartney filed suit, but rather that it took him so long to do so. Yeah, I mean, I know McCartney is a PR expert, and he, he tried to play, oh, I didn't want to do it, I didn't want to do it. I believe him in that case, that Mm -hmm. the idea of suing John, George, and Ringo just made him sick. And we know from other accounts, uh, you know, that he was perhaps drinking a bit much in 1970, and he was having an awful time of it. And I think any of us that have been involved in lawsuits, and I do it as a bystander, I don't do it as a litigant, but... Being a plaintiff in a lawsuit is not fun. Being a defendant in a lawsuit is not fun. And doing it with your friends, I, I can't imagine it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there were several things in your article where it just seemed like it was piling one thing on top of another where John, George, and Ringo agreed to something that Paul didn't consent to. Yeah, and, and Paul didn't make it any easier on himself by, you know, what was there, three billion people on the planet at the time, and he wanted to bring in his in-laws? I mean, that was not a good move. By the same token, there's three billion people on the planet at the time, and the three of them picked the one guy that the Rolling Stones are saying, eh, I don't know. You you might want to look out there. So it it just shows the deterioration of the personal relationships they had in 1969 that it obviously started. We can go back to the death of Epstein, and, and that's a whole other story. But it... It's really sad when you look at, at that article of what what Paul claimed and what was accepted by the judge. That was another reason I only wrote it from one side, because what Paul said was true was accepted as true, that how he was being mistreated um, in the partnership. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, if three partners vote to do something, the fourth one doesn't have veto power. He's stuck with that decision. And the three of them were imposing on Paul decisions he didn't want to be a part of i don't know if this this is a question that could be answered easily or not but 
in general, when a group like the Beatles or, you know, that are separately or, you know, one of the Beatles goes to court, is there, I mean, this is, it's obviously a, a different situation than, you know, than, than you or I as, as, you know, as defendants or, or plaintiffs going in ourselves. Am I making too much out of that? Do you understand what I'm trying to ask there? It's it's a different situation. It takes it to a different level, does it not? If the judge is starstruck, it would be. <laughs> is that usually the case? Well, I don't know. I mean, Lance Ito certainly was. but Right. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> but I, I don't know if every judge is. The judges example, in the cases you wrote about seem not to have been. I mean, there, one of them is talking about teenagers buying records and they <laughs> they seem not to have you know and also in the case of the harrison suit um i think he said that my when they were trying to figure out how much of the album royalties george had to pay he referred to the songs as less than memorable yeah <laughs> so probably not starstruck <laughs> yeah. in that particular case uh i was i was about to say the same thing judge owen obviously ruled against uh, Harrison. So if he was uh, impressed that he had a beetle in his midst, it didn't affect his legal judgment. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- I'm trying to think of the other lawsuits. Uh, the Star Club one that's also on the, the website, the Beatles lost that one. So the, the judge that was ruling in that case, again, didn't have a case of, oh, I better rule for the Beatles here. So uh, to answer your question, the evidence in front of me does not really support the idea that the Beatles got a leg up when they went into a courtroom. Mm-hmm. But it, 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 it just generally talking, I, I, you mentioned the Star Club suit and how they lost at that point, but they won later. What was the difference? Okay, back to my I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I wrote the star club article around the same time in fact it may be the year before that the sony suit yeah this came out in 95 Mm -hmm. and i want to think the sony thing came out in 95 later or in in 96 and since i never wrote about it i never researched it i just know that it was a different result and that's the one article of the bunch that probably i need to go back to if i ever take a, a mind and dig up the sony and write the entire article what i wrote is correct it's just not complete now. Mm-hmm. Well, and then there was the the proposed release after that that got nailed. Um, I think we're talking about two separate. The, there's a Sony, and then there's the one after that. Um, I, know, I know I bought one of them at Best Buy, uh, 2000, 2002, something like that, and I was yeah. surprised it was there. I think that's the one. I think that's the one I'm referring to. That's the one where I interviewed. The guy, um, that was Fuego Entertainment. Um, I don't know. It's downstairs. I, I don't know the okay. cartoonish cover, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I barely remember that. But, yeah, that was the one where they started out putting the, uh, the tracks on the website one at a time, and then they put the whole thing out, and, th- and then the Beatles came in and stopped them. So. I, said, I, I was surprised that I found it in Best Buy. Surprised enough that I opened my wallet and took one home. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there's still, you know, Star Club stuff is still out there, even though it supposedly has been stopped. You can, and I'm not talking about bootleg sites on the internet. I mean, it's, there are places, it, it is out there. So, although not as complete, I mean, there have been very complete bootleg versions, but there are versions of, you know, some versions out there. Um, but in any event, um, uh, Alan, uh, Ken, you want to? You got something you want to? Uh, you want to ask about? I just want to know why, when it first came out in 1977, the Beatles didn't win the case. There's an American expression called "you snooze, you lose," <laughs> and and that's what happened. They they had known that Linga Song was putting this together for a while. I was reading this article and I have to refresh my memory. This is the one I don't refer to very often because, as I said, it's it's not complete anymore. But ultimately, Lingus, they had sued for an injunction. And in order to get an injunction, you have to be able to show a few things that you're about to suffer irreparable harm and that uh, 
that you're in a good position to win the case and uh, that money damages would not suffice. And they just, they couldn't make their claim. They started with the proposition that they conceded that permission had been made or had been given for the making of the tape. And from there, they just, they just waited too long. If they had moved, I'm, I'm speculating now, if they'd moved six or eight months earlier, I think they might've had a shot at it, but they just waited until Lingasong had spent so much money that the judge just wasn't going to enjoin the release. Hmm. Oddly enough, I never saw that they sued for damages, which was still open to them after the release. They sued to try to stop it, but afterwards they didn't, I don't see any record. They sued for damages. Hmm. I find that unusual. <laughs> Something you, know, else. you can always make the case that the Beatles had such high standards for their music that this was, you know, not a great quality recording and uh, that could their reputation could suffer. But yeah, they, 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 they put the Quarryman tape on the anthology. That's much later, though. <laughs> yeah, that's with their own permission, though. But so. the, the, I, the, but the anthology, I mean, that Quarryman tape is worse than the Hamburg tape, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, I'm just I mean, saying in 1977, it was a, you know, go right. back to that time. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, as, as a, uh, I mean, basically, yeah, in that, but I mean, why they put the Quarryman tape on the anthology and not the Star Club, when in fact the Star Club stuff actually was historically, I think, just as important, if not more so, than the Quarryman stuff. And it was also a lot more listenable. Yeah, but. I've- I was surprised there was no Star Club on the anthology. It, that, right. At least a sample of some of it. Uh, mm-hmm. Came back to your question. I took a quick look. Uh, the judge found that the Beatles were they were suing under uh, it was an English act that I can't quote off the top of my head, but they brought the action under some dramatic performance. I don't know the name of it. And MPPA is what I've got here in front of me. Uh, they any. He, he, he said they weren't going to win, and it was unfair to do the last-minute proceedings. After months of silence by the Beatles, uh, he just wasn't going to enjoin it. I remember because my email address is on Steve's website, I got an email one time from someone purporting to be King Size Taylor. Hmm. Uh, I have no idea whether it was or not. I don't know why, of all the people on the planet, someone would try to impersonate Ted Taylor, but he he said he was king size and wanted to know why I didn't contact him about the article before I wrote it. And I said, well, I didn't need to. Uh, I'm writing about what was in the legal proceedings and I didn't really need to interview you for it. And he fired something back and then we stopped communicating. But <laughs> we could go on and on about legal cases. I mean, there have been so many, the Beatles, the Beatles legal cases beyond just the ones we've talked about, beyond the ones that Sutcher wrote about in his book. I mean, there's just so many crazy, crazy things. I mean, the Northern Songs thing is another, you know, with, with Michael Jackson is another crazy situation. Uh, I mean, there's just, there's the, uh, we, I think we mentioned the Ringo lawsuit there's, I mean, there's just so many weirdo things. Um, you mean, you mean the chips moment, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many weirdo moments, legal moments. The Apple versus Apple. That's another. That's another really good one. And I mean, I wish we, I wish there was, wish we had the material in front of us about that one. Although, yeah, I mean that that was a crazy situation. You know. Oh. That, yeah, I, I suspect. One is on your website would have been probably four chapters in my book that I never wrote. Mm-hmm. After I had finished the third one, I became a father and I would also run a, a law practice, a small practice. I could not take off for two weeks and go to England and go digging through the files. I couldn't go to New York for a week or whatever it would take. Uh, the Chips Moment case you talked about would have been a trip to Nashville to look through the files. I, did, I made a decision that I was not going to sacrifice family for a book, especially if I was having to fund the, the travel and everything myself. And uh, as it is, other people have beat me to certain aspects of it. John Wiener's book and uh, Leon Wiles have written books on the immigration battle. Um, Bruce Spicer in his VJ 
uh, book did a wonderful job on the lawsuit uh, that was filed by Capital against BJ. I mean, we got Apple to the core. Uh, you never give me your money. There's uh, and I haven't read all of Professor Sutcher's book. I've skimmed it mainly in preparation for this uh, discussion tonight. What I saw looked factually accurate. Uh, he and I would write differently. He writes about a he writes more topical, and I'd probably do more chronological. Uh, but what I've seen of it so far, I could recommend it to someone. Okay. So are you going to do okay. it now, now that, you know, your son is grown? <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, probably not. The uh, Still back to the funding. I mean, if, if some publisher thought they could make a lot of money off of it, and if you're listening and offered me some money uh, <laughs> where I could take off work for a little while and go do it, yeah, maybe. But speaking of digging through the files and stuff reminded me of my favorite story of all these things that I wrote. I, my recompense was the pat on the back I got from people. I didn't make a nickel on writing any of these. No, you did not, because I did not pay you. No, well, so, I, mean, you, I didn't. You you just published them. Uh, I just, on, I, on I, that I did. I wrote them for the nine ten and also for Beetle Fan, and I didn't expect any money for them, but. I came back to the office one day, and my par my uh, receptionist says, you got a call, and she, it was kind of strange. She handed it to me, and it said Mark Lewison. And I thought, it was one of my internet buddies being a joker. <laughs> and I looked at the number, and it didn't have all the numbers in the same order that we would have here. And I've called, <laughs> I've called England before. So I call the number and got a very nice British accent on the other end. And I won't try to do my British accent, but it was Mark. A he was... He was curious about something of the of the Harrison My Sweet Lord suit. He wanted to, to verify. So he asked Alan, he said, do you think he would mind if I called? And Alan said, no. <laughs> so I got to become acquainted with uh, Mark. I got his private email address, and he and I have chatted a few times over the years about, about some things. So that was my biggest recompense for doing these, was getting to make the acquaintance of Mark Lewis. And <laughs> Okay, I should I should mention to everyone listening that in addition to Mark Lewis and um, Joey and I and Alan have known actually Alan's known I think Joey longer than I have, but Joey and I and Alan have known each other for decades. Is that is that about right? Yes, nineteen ninety on Prodigy. Right on Prodigy. Yeah, all three of us were on there at the same time. Right uh, through. Through circumstances, Alan had been in Tulsa a few times, which is about an hour and 45 minutes away from me. And I drove up and we met there. He also met me at the airport uh, when I was going to England in 92. And then I crashed on his couch for a couple of days in 1996 when I was in, in New York for a Beetle Fest. So, yeah, Alan and I, we go way back. Yeah, and of course, back. You, I, <laughs> Steve, but Alan way back. I, way close. back. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I'm a yeah. new acquaintance. You are. You're you're my new best friend. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm still All trying right. to figure out your accent, you know. I don't know what you've said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an accent, Alan. You're the one with the accent. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Yeah, Alan's, Alan's, got, Alan's got the main accent. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, a, a yeah boot. right. <laughs> there we go. There we go. He's going to be a, a New Englander like me. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I think we are running pretty close to our time um this has been really nice and uh, joey we uh, i think we need to do this again sometime maybe get a couple more of those lawsuits and talk about them in detail i know we had mentioned in the uh before we started we were talking about the mccartney uh uh heather mills uh divorce suit um I mean, that would be interesting. Um, hey, I can think of one more that Joey actually was sort of involved in that maybe we, if, if you want to mention sure. it. But Go ahead. Um, when Apple uh, tried to get Doug Sulpey to <laughs> scrap um, drugs, divorce, and a slipping image and send them all the materials and all that stuff, I, I believe, didn't you sort of intercede on his behalf? I wouldn't call it intercede. Doug, and he has told this, I believe, so I, I'm free to talk about it. He call me and then fax me the nice little nasty letter he got from Apple and telling him that he had, he could not use copyrighted material. Uh, the upshot was if you go back and read Doug, uh, 
drugs, divorce, and slipping image, or whatever it's called now, instead of saying or giving quotes uh, like, um, I'm warming to the idea of an asylum as far as playing, Doug would have to say that Lennon or Harrison, whichever one said that, opined that going to a mental facility might be a better option. Uh, he had to go back and change all of the quotes. It's a paraphrase, uh, yeah. And it made for interesting reading, but uh, no lawsuit was filed there. Doug decided that eating was better than hiring lawyers. Again, I don't understand that mentality, but uh, <laughs> but, but he he took discretion as his better part of valor. Mm-hmm. And what was funny was he didn't mention me in the credits of that book, even though I did have a small contribution to it. And then I got mentioned in one of his outtake books, one I had nothing to do with, but I was mentioned in the thank you in the credits. <laughs> <laughs> do you have anything to do with any other Beatle legal things besides that? Uh, no. No. Uh, that, that's as close as I got to being. You know, I told him, I said, look, Doug. Tell him to sue you, and let's bring McCartney in for a deposition. <laughs> I thought it was fun. But he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to have fun the way I wanted to have fun. Oh, okay. That's what we wanted okay. to do with Magic Alex. We figured if we went to England for the trial, that we would have to have the Beatles come and testify. So, The, the remaining Beatles. Can I ask, happens. Alan, did, did you guys talk about Magic Alex? Did you uh, and Joey talk about that? I don't think so, did we? Briefly, but you had a good lawyer. You didn't need me. Yeah, the Times had an in-house guy, plus they had a British firm, because this was a British case, and uh, yeah. Why don't you just briefly give that rundown, what that was, for people who <laughs> you didn't hear? Because ta- I know we've talked about that before, but just for people who aren't aware of what we're talking about, just run down what that is. Okay, um when I was working for the Times, um, Maharishi died in, I think, 2008. And my editors came and asked me to do a story about what it all means in Beatles terms. Um, and usually for a story like this, the, the underlying question really is, what is the cultural yield of the Beatles' association with Maharishi? Um, and I thought that that was actually a pretty easy question because... Until that point, um, they sort of would come into the studio, I mean, through Pepper, with things unfinished and finish them in the studio and all that. And uh, then they went to Rishikesh um, to sit at the Maharishi's feet and meditate and came back with, you know, 27 songs that they demoed at George's houses and then did the White Album, which didn't even use all 27 songs and had other songs. Um, You know, it was a huge yield and so i i said you know basically the cultural yield of their association with the maharishi is this huge burst of creativity so then you have to you know you have to anticipate certain reader questions and the obvious reader question would be well if if this was so amazing for them why did they split with the maharishi and well this is where magic alex comes in you know magic alex was you know uh, uh, their electronics guru he came flying down to india he really wasn't keen on the beatles paying as much attention to the maharishi as they were when they could be paying that attention to him and so he started these rumors about the maharishi putting moves on various of the women at the ashram and finally john and george left now in john's case i think he had just sort of gotten to that point where he lost interest anyway and wanted to go back, but he made it into a a cause, you know. Well, if the Maharishi's doing this, we, we he's not so cosmic, we got to get out of here. Once I told that story, I, I had to say who Magic Alex was, because bizarrely enough, not everybody on the planet knows who Magic Alex is. Mm-hmm. And since this wasn't a story about Magic Alex, I had to do it in, like, a sentence. So I just described him as a charlatan and so-called inventor. <laughs> Um, which I I think basically most people who know the Beatles story and know Magic Alex's involvement with them would consider that fair. Plus, in the U.S., I think you can can confirm this, Joey, um, there is nothing particularly libelous about Charlatan. Um, It's not not libel per se. You know, libel per se was things like imputing unchastity to a woman. I mean, all these things that everybody says every day in every paper now. 
uh, in, imputing homosexuality to a male. I, I think the whole concept of libel per se has sort of gone out the window because all these are such antique concepts. But um, charlatan, you know, so we heard from Alex's lawyer. It, it, it turns out that Alex um, had a subsidiary career after the Beatles of basically shaking down any newspaper that mentioned him and talked about his recording studio or his artificial sun or his invisible wallpaper or, you know, all these things. And in England, newspapers have a budget for stuff like this, like a nuisance suit budget. And they'd pay him a few thousand pounds and he'd go away. What he wasn't counting on was the New York Times doesn't take that view. They say, if our writer is correct, we will defend him. And so it became a lawsuit that stretched on for a couple of years. And uh, we finally settled. We didn't give him any money. We allowed him to affix a statement to my piece, if you go online and look up, you know, under my name, Maharishi, Magic Alex, the piece will come up. And at the end of the piece is a PDF from Alex in which, if you read it, he fundamentally proves that he's a charlatan. <laughs> so so that was that, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, but we were, we, my editors and I, some of us anyway, were, were thinking, you know, wow, well, this is going to be the, you know, the Beatles lawsuit of the century and we're going to be in it. You know, we were all ready to go to London. One of the reasons that we ended up settling is because in British libel law, this is a mind blower, things like the definition of a word with which you supposedly libeled someone is not admissible in court. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> and you got roped into into England because it re, the story was printed in the U.S. and then it was run on a subsidiary or a, a no. sister publication. Or um, because the New York Times is available in England, so even though we're not in England, and Magic Alex at that time was living in Greece, England has this thing that is widely known as libel tourism, which is that anything that gets published or distributed in England can be the subject of a lawsuit even even if neither party lives in England or is English. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, the Times had a visit from a deputation from Parliament that um, was looking into changing Britain's libel law because they you know, knew how ridiculous it was. And they came and sat down and met with us. It was really kind of interesting. Ooh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Alan. Thank any, you, Joey. Anytime. We're going to, uh, I'm going to quickly uh, let uh, everybody, or we're going to quickly let everybody know where you can get a hold of us, starting with you, Ken. Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I have to mention a couple things real quick, and I'm sure that uh, some of our listeners will want to know about this. I mentioned in our last show that there's a radio special connected to the concert for George, which actually ran on the radio station where I do the live broadcast of my weekly show, Every Little Thing. And actually, I was given permission to put that show, that radio special, on my website. Mm -hmm. So anyone who wants to hear it, it's got music from the concert for George. It's got interviews with the performers, Paul, Ringo, Eric Clapton, uh, Billy Preston, Tom Petty, Jeff Lynn. It's there on the website. If you go to my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, you look at where it says More Interviews, that tab. You go to the drop-down menu. There's one page just for the concert for George radio special. So if you want to hear it, it's right there. And that's only going to be for a limited time. Also, I mentioned on last week's show that I just did a brand new interview with Neil Linus. He was a tremendous guest on our show, and he's just so funny and entertaining. We tackled a lot of subjects in my interview that we didn't do on Things We Said Today. I got to tell you, in particular, what he had to say about the song Brave Sir Robin <laughs> is one of the funniest things in any interview I've ever done. I'll just tell you that Elvis Presley was a big Monty Python fan. And he was a big fan of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And what Neil has to say about that, I think, will we'll have you in stitches. Hmm. But we talked about so many things, being in two George Harrison videos, being in Magical Mystery Tour, some of the same stuff we did on, 
on things we said today, but a lot of other stuff as well. So in addition to that, I'm going to be at the Fest for Beetle Fans this coming weekend, March 9th through the 11th. And I'm only going to be there on Saturday, but I will be on a panel in the Act Naturally room with Kid O'Toole and Darren DeVivo, who have been great guests here on this show, frequently here on this program. It's at the uh, Hyatt Regency on the Hudson, and uh, the fest is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but uh, like I said, I'll only be there on Saturday. So if you can, stop by and say hi. Okay, thank you, Ken. Alan? Um, you can generally reach me through the Magic Alex is a Great Inventor fan club. Um, well, <laughs> maybe you should just go to my Facebook page, which is either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. There are two of them. There you go. Okay. You can get a hold of me uh, by emailing beetlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles news and information page where I post, post my stories and other Beatles news stories. You can get a hold of the show by uh, emailing um, things we said today uh, radio show at gmail.com. We have a things we said today Beatles radio fan pa- fans page on Facebook. There's a uh, also a uh, things we said today page uh, for the fab4radio.com broadcast which are at noon at midnight ET uh, on Sunday and and noon on Saturday so in other words reverse that but anyway so you can catch the show there as well as on Podbean on iTunes on YouTube uh, tune in radio we are we are all over the place you can't not find us I mean just hit the right things we said today, Beatles radio fans, in your browser, and you will find us. And that's about it, folks. Uh, Joey, again, Joey Self, uh, uh, Attorney Joey Self, thank you for being our guest today. This, this has You're been welcome. a great, a great show. For it was Ste- wonderful to be here. It was certainly a thrill. You're such a lovely audience. <laughs> <laughs> and we would we would like to bring you back sometime. So there okay. we go. Anyway, uh, for uh, Joey Self, Alan Cozen, Ken Michaels, and myself, Steve Marinucci, this has been Things We Said Today, and we look forward to being back here next week, and we look forward to seeing you all. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>